Hi, we're back for the experimental part of the program, kind of, the new, new kind of thing. Um, I, I just heard, just as a way of passing this on to Craig Mundy, um, <clears throat> that we've had uh, 1,500 or 1,700 or something like that people signed up who actually attended uh, or something like that. So that's exciting. Um, um, so thank you for, for participating. Uh, this is now going to be three quick talks by Craig, Mira, and Larry Hunter. And then with almost no break, three seconds, a panel discussion. And um, like this morning, we're hoping that there will be lots of questions and statements and outrage and all that stuff because uh, this is a very interesting topic. And as I said this morning, <clears throat> we will plan on growing this part of it, the big data part, every year until we all understand what we're talking about, which may take more time than um, we have. But that's the idea. So again, send Meredith and me thoughts about this. And with that, I would like to be the one that introduces you, reintroduces you to Craig Mundy, uh, who is right there, I see him. Um, he's uh, our friend. I, I have used, if that's the right word, used as uh, Craig and Larry as my mentors as I've tried to figure all this out. I have a long way to go. And so uh, I want to tell you one really important thing about Craig Mundy. The hardest question I ever asked him, which I did, I said to him one day, can you explain quantum computing to me? And his answer was, no. <laughs> A remarkable moment in our friendship. <laughs> I, I didn't even disagree, actually. I didn't push. So Craig, please jump in and get us going here. Thanks, Larry. Um, I'm the lead off speaker here on this uh, three part program. And uh, Larry asked us to do two things, which I'll try to do uh, in two parts. One was to just explain a little bit about uh, ourselves and the perspective that we bring to this particular problem uh, or question. Uh, and then, you know, put in some uh, prefacing remarks, you know, to hopefully seed the conversation that the panel will have and hopefully engage the audience in uh, as we go. So, you know, my, uh, my background has been one that has sort of had a focus on computing, both hardware and software, for 50 years now, a little more than 50 years. And, uh, but coincidentally, uh, you know, I've had a sort of a fascination with the intersection of computing and biology literally ever since I was in college. And, uh, you know, I never finished uh, completing my PhD because I was too busy doing startups at the time. And the academic community told me that that was not allowed. And so I had to pick one. So I picked computing over medicine and I picked commercial versus academic, you know, as a focus. And, you know, it, it worked out okay. And, but, you know, I've basically been through sort of a, a mini computer generation, mostly doing software, the supercomputing uh, generation, doing hardware and software. Uh, and then I joined Microsoft in 1992 and spent the rest of my career there. Officially, I retired at the end of 2014. Uh, and I, my role really had two parts. I did a lot of the incubation work for Microsoft in many areas. And when Bill Gates retired, ended up overseeing Microsoft Research. Uh, I also did all the policy work on a global basis for the company on technology policy uh, for about 17 years. And so that brought me to many of the world's uh, countries and, and discussions with their governments and tried to you know, anticipate how technology was going to play out and affect you know, the, their societies and how they might plan for it. 
since retiring, which I sort of failed doing, I decided to devote my time to consulting with mostly CEOs in companies that are facing this question of how will technology alter their businesses. And many of these folks are very successful, but recognize that there's a sea change coming, not just through the use of computation writ large, but perhaps more recently because of the arrival of this artificial intelligence concept. And I'm among those who think that this is probably, you know, the biggest thing that we've seen in many, many decades. Computing itself, of course, has been large. And, you know, this conference would indicate that, you know, without it, many of the things that we focus on, even in biology or medicine, you know, would not be what they are today. And so it's at times difficult to grasp that we're about to embark on the introduction of computer-based technologies, the implications of which are much bigger than everything computing has done so far. And that's a lot. And so that's sort of, in some sense, the perspective that I bring to this. The particular focus, while I was not as kind to Larry on the quantum computing question as he was to me on the biology question, I came to know Larry about five years ago when I was asked, you know, to get involved with Soma Logic. And, you know, I told Larry at the time that, you know, my luxury at that moment was that I only got to, I only needed to work on problems I thought were important with people I liked. And I immediately had a liking to Larry. And I believed from many years that I'd spent both at the Hutch, where I was a trustee in Seattle, and for about a decade being friends and now a director of the Institute for Systems Biology with Lee Hood, that the proteome was sort of the missing link, so to speak, at least in a quest for high-scale data-driven explorations of biology and medicine or their intersection. And so when I met Larry and learned about Soma Logic, I thought, okay, this, you know, ought to be important and yet obviously won't make a lot of progress unless it has really sophisticated computing. And so you got to hear yesterday from both Roy and the Boysia, you know, and I think, you know, those talks sort of bracket the realization that I think we somewhat came to together that, you know, we really have to blend a very sophisticated computation with a large amount of data, and in particular these molecular assays, in order to be able to, you know, get some real traction against what the future of medicine and biology might be. I've also been involved for about a decade with the Cleveland Clinic, and today I'm the advisor to them on sort of the future of how they think medicine and the teaching of medicine will evolve. And I helped to design their recent medical school, which was notable in that the only thing I really brought to it was a focus on using augmented reality as a way to teach many things. But we started with teaching anatomy. So it's the first medical school in the country of note that in 100 years it has no cadavers. And we've been successful in migrating all of that kind of teaching from poking at dead bodies to understanding these things in ways that have been unexpectedly good for the student. Larry mentioned that I spoke at this symposium a couple years ago, and in that I actually showed work that I had done using augmented reality with, in this case, my wife's own cancer case, coupled with the work of the Cleveland Clinic and Case Western, and showed that when you bring these things together, you get surprisingly powerful capabilities. And my wife's surgery was, in fact, planned using, for the first time ever, the 3D model of her entire innards that the surgeons could visualize before they cut her open. And that turned out to be quite useful. I also went on to think kind of deeply about the intersection of artificial intelligence, and in particular the quest for artificial intelligence, because not long after I got associated with Soma Logic, I also started to be a coach and consultant to the leaders at OpenAI, where Mira, who's on the panel with us, is a key exec, and I've come to know her quite well 
in that context and, and thank her for her participation in the discussion today. But as I learned about the AGI quest and I thought about the, you know, the evolution of biology and medicine, I gave a talk at the clinic about a year and a half ago where basically the headline was um, human biology is too complicated for humans, but probably not for machines. And a, a lot of what I've been focusing on in, in this domain the last couple of years is thinking about what the ramifications of that are. Uh, and then, you know, as I work with the artificial intelligence community writ large, both at OpenAI and Microsoft, where I still spend a third of my time, you know, it, it really leads me to, to think far out about uh, how, how these things are all gonna play out. Uh, it's been interesting to observe in other quarters, uh, you know, how many people are starting to come to grips with the profound effects of having machine intelligence. And, you know, to kick off this uh, conversation, about you know how the what is the evolution and that'll be my role you know i have to admit that and i'm not an expert in any one of these areas you know my real two coaches in or three coaches you could say in biology so far were lee hartwell uh just before he got the nobel prize when he was you know at the at the hutch uh, uh lee hood at, at isb and larry you know, since I got affiliated with Somalogic, those three people have done more to try to give me a basic understanding of some of these molecular issues uh, than anybody else. And I've tried to reciprocate a little bit and help them say how I think about uh, computing as it relates to their problems. But I'm not an expert in AI in a deep way. If, if I'm an expert in anything, it's really the intersection between computing the hardware for computing and the software for computing and how that's going to be optimized. And I think that's an important point for this audience to understand is that, you know, over the last six or seven years, as it relates to doing the computation specifically associated with artificial intelligence, uh, the, cap the, the capacity of the machines has grown by about a factor of 50,000, maybe more. And so many people are familiar with Moore's law and, you know, Moore's law, you know, says, oh, you know, really you said transistor size would have and, you know, and that got extrapolated that computer performance would double about every 18 months. Uh, and so going up by a factor of 50,000 or more in five or six years, uh, you know, is a relatively big step beyond the Moore's law phenomenon, which is also sort of slowing down. How did that happen? It happens because there's a revolution coming in computer architecture. The general purpose machines or even vector processing machines that have brought us all to this point in computation are rapidly gonna be superseded by machines that are custom built uh, in order to be able to accelerate the unique types of computations that are gonna correspond to each of the evolving classes of models that are emerging. Uh, and and so we won't delve into that too much today, but I think it's important for people to understand the rate at which these things are changing. And as I think perhaps Mira will comment, or we'll certainly talk about in the panel, uh, in this case, the capacities do matter. You know, when biologists compare things about the size of brains, you know, in, uh, in humans and mice and fruit flies and other things, you know, that they talk about, well, how big as this brain in terms of its sort of neuronic capacity. And uh, and it turns out for machines, there, it is gonna matter too. And the thing that most people still don't fully appreciate uh, because it's kind of happened in a blink is just how quickly the machines have started to scale up to a size where they're an appreciable fraction, you know, of, uh, of what a human brain is. And of course, the human brain does a lot of different things. And I don't think anybody really has an accurate model of how much of that human brain represents the real cognitive capability as opposed to the, the parts that are sort of uh, automation, if you will. 
I mean, I think one of the earlier speakers distinguished automation from prediction. And, you know, one, I think, could ask, you know, how much of what the human brain does is automation and how much of its prediction? And in fact, is that all it does? And I think as we'll talk perhaps in the panel about, you know, this, the idea of prediction may actually be fundamental in how thought happens. And, uh, and you know, the work that OpenAI has done, you know, I think shows surprising results, you know, when you combine this focus on prediction with a real drive towards scale. Uh, and, and I think Mira will, you know, give you some examples of that. One of the things that, you know, I want to do is talk a little bit uh, about how has this evolution of AI really happened? Uh, you know, its first incarnations actually were in the 1960s. And, you know, I remember actually in the mid 80s when I was designing a supercomputer, I was surprised to find that one of the applications that some people wanted to use the supercomputer for was to uh, run neural networks. Uh, and, and it, it didn't, you know, didn't make much headway, uh, but people were pursuing it. And in fact, you know, in the sixties, people came up with this idea of the perceptron, which is sort of a, a re representation, you know, derived from what was understood about human, uh, you know, neural processes. Um, and then they said, well, by itself, that little thing doesn't do much. And so by about the 1980s, that it evolved toward what we think of as multi-layer perceptrons. And here we're starting to build networks, layered networks of these neural things, and then to do computational simulation of how they might all work. And I think, you know, the, uh, in the 1990s, that evolved toward very small convolutional neural networks. Uh, but I think the key problem at the time is that there were two things that were just too small. The computation and storage capabilities were just too small to do anything that really looked interesting. Uh, and the amount of data that you had to try to train anything was sort of too small as well. And so we entered, uh, you know, more or less a period of time, I think at that point for another 20 years, where we were in the AI winter. Some might argue the AI winter, you know, lasted the better part of that 50 years from the 60s until the 2010s. And, uh, and sort of while everybody was sleeping during the winter, what was happening was the internet was exploding and all the connectivity and, and data creation, you know, that was spawned by all those computers and all that computation. Uh, and computers themselves were just getting aggregated to be bigger and bigger. And we were creating more and more capability, uh, including now, you know, specialty architectures. And so around 2017, you know, there was, a, you know, we'd seen a few other things that as the machines grew, we got into larger CNNs. How did we do that? We put them on GPUs to make, a, you know, the acceleration computationally, you know, more tractable. And, you know, people started looking at a variety of other things. And there was a seminal paper in 2017, you know, where it was positive, well, maybe attention, you know, was all you really needed to have. Uh, but just a year later, uh, and it came, you know, from OpenAI, uh, as well as uh, some work at Google and others, but this model called BERT, uh, you know, started to come on the scene. And with it, you know, these were called transformers. And the models, you know, were different again. And how to optimize them to fit on the hardware was different again. But in less than three years, the, trans the work on transformers and scaling them up, you know, has just revolutionized, you know, what seems to be possible. And, you know, how clearly, in my mind at least, the path becomes to getting to something that really does resemble much more a general intelligence. And so, you know, now we're really looking at trying to optimize those things and figure out how to deal with the costs of trading off, you know, the, the cost of training these models 
with the cost of deploying them, i.e. the difference between training and inferencing. And I think you know that'll become an ongoing challenge because as the as the machines get bigger and the training gets more expensive, you know we can't afford to have the same costs associated with their use. And so a lot of research is going on there. You know, so just to close on, uh, out on sort of my view of, of what are some of the things in this rapidly accelerating field that are likely to happen over the next three or four years. One is I think you're gonna see a more explicit combination uh, of large scale data, i.e. what we might think of as classic data sets not for the purposes of training, uh, but for the purposes of being hybridized, you know, with what the models learn by whatever, you know, means they learn and with whatever data they learn. I think a lot of this will move probably into more of a graph structure. Today, we're in kind of a simple uh, aggregation model of transformers in, in some applications. Uh, and I think that'll, that'll change. And I think we'll see more reinforcement learning uh, and finally, we'll see it applied to much, much bigger models than we have in the past. That's important because as it relates to many of the scientific questions that were discussed here, the idea of models that learn by themselves from unlabeled data, and in fact, from data that can be generated at the, at the behest of the, of the model, uh, I think is showing that the machines are in fact capable, I don't know whether you want to call it thought or not, but they are capable of exploring spaces that humans cannot explore and finding answers in those spaces uh, that humans will never find. Perhaps more challenging, philosophically almost, but certainly mentioned by the audience a few times today, I contend that these things will not be explainable to humans either. That, you know, that, that the machine will basically be doing reasoning at a scale and across so many domains simultaneously in order to produce these answers that no individual, even polymathic human, uh, or even you know, a team of those humans will actually be able, even if the machine was capable of being dissected or even smart enough to explain itself, uh, for the humans to say, yeah, I get it. And I think that is you know, one of the challenges that we've got to think about and discuss. I think there'll be three big developments in the next few years. One, there'll be more uh, use of sort of augmented simulation. If you look at, for example, what came from Alpha Fold, which was Google's you know, attempt to enter into the protein folding prediction contest uh, that had been going on for a couple decades or more, Everybody up to that point had tried to predict how things would fold by building literal computational models of the physics. And, you know, they had some progress, but, you know, they were nowhere close to thinking it was like a solved problem. And, and in two generations of, of uh, you know, effort by Google to predict how things would fold, not based on simulating the physics, but on looking at how many things that had been studied folded and learning what makes them fold it was able to make a prediction, much better prediction uh, than, than all of the modeling efforts had uh, collectively provided. And so I think this, this is gonna be a super important thing is to use models at high scale to predict directions that need to be pursued in science and ways in which those things might be solved. I think we're gonna see this combination of models and databases in ways that haven't yet happened uh, uh, and the, the example I just gave of, of protein folding is sort of one such example. Uh, and, you know, we're probably going to see differential programming, in, in, which by that I mean is the ability for the models to add, learn, to essentially adjust themselves uh, in the way that they learn, as they learn. Uh, and that, you know, each of these will represent a, a substantial advance from what we know today. So, you know, my gift, if I have one, given that I'm not an expert in much of anything, is that I pattern match really well. And so when I look across these fields, you know, and I try to predict the future, I become pretty convinced that most of the things that the last day and a half's worth of speakers said, you know, uh, were unlikely to be able to be done by machines, I actually differ. I think almost 100% of them will be done by machines. 
And, uh, and in fact, I think in many cases, the machines will move to do things that the humans just can't do. And it, in part, it comes from humans are just biologically limited. You know, we're carbon based, so we have a very slow clock rate. We have really crummy IO systems. You know, the only high bandwidth one we have is vision, and it only works at a very high level of abstraction and without a great deal of precision. And I think one of the things we're learning as the machines get bigger, they don't actually suffer this problem of a loss of precision. And therefore, it may in fact be that the thing that limits the rate of learning by humans is the fact that they can't take in a lot of precise data. So only through abstraction and, and long periods of, of trial and error do they learn to distinguish the signal from the noise. Machines may be able to do that faster. And I think we see, for me at least, indications that many of these things are likely to be true. So, you know, I'm, a, I'm bullish about it. I kind of go into it with eyes wide open about what the implications of this mean. I think it's going to be transformational for society. And, you know, I'll just close with a thought because it comes back to the biology and understanding it. You know, as people pointed out, we now have the ability to, to mess around with our own biology. And, you know, what we lack is the CAD CAM system to allow us to design the changes that we'd like to make. <laughs> I believe that, you know, these artificial intelligences, you know, will ultimately result in having that system. And so, you know, we may really be at the end for our species of natural evolution, that in the future, this species will decide to design itself to be better. And, uh, and it's hard to understand what that might mean, but I think it's my answer to, to the people who say, well, wh I don't want to just become a pet to the super intelligence. I don't know why humans would relegate themselves to that role when in fact, you know, they should be able to use this to improve themselves, uh, perhaps in some form of hybridization. Uh, so that takes us from the history to my own musings on, you know, where this all ends up in the next 20 to 50 years. Uh, but I think it's going to be a, a very profound change. So let me stop there and give the floor to Mira. <laughs>